Good morning. Good morning. Look at all these people here to hear Martha. I'm so excited. Anyway, good morning, good morning. Thank you all for coming. I hope everybody can hear. Uh, to welcome to Los Angeles, the City of Angels, a woman who is an angel in my life and I know in the life of so many people, a real architect of change, Martha Beck. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Martha and I uh, go way back and uh, she's been instrumental in my life in so many ways. So I'm so thrilled about this new book of hers, Diana Herself, which is her first piece of nonfiction. And I want to no, start- Fiction. Fiction, excuse me. First fiction and everything else has been nonfiction. But I want to start with the end of the book because she says this is her best self-help book ever. And I want to start from that place because it's all made up. Martha, how could that be possible? You've created a whole world in this book and it's actually something that we can use in this world today. Well, it's actually the world I live in and I've been pretending that I lived in the normal world for a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, and what happens is if you self-help enough, I said, my daughter said to me one day, I said, someone asked me what self-help I'm reading and I don't read self-help. And she said, well, that's because you self-helped. <laughs> and what happens is you self-help is your life gets better and then it gets good and then it starts to get magical. And you've seen that happen. I've watched it happen to you. So then you can't write about it anymore because people don't think it's true. So I was like, boom, fantasy fiction. Take it or leave it. <laughs> you know? But so you, you tricked us by creating a whole world. And, but, but what do you think is the lessons of the world you created? I didn't, cr I gotta say this again. I moved to the forest of California mm -hmm. because yeah, I, Welcome to California. Thank you all. That's, That's not bad, it. coming from the <laughs> former first lady. Um, <laughs> But it's the word, uh, world I actually live in. I get up every morning and I, I hear only birds and wind and water. And I meditate for an hour covered in bird seed and the birds and chipmunks are on me. And, I, and reality just <gasps> shocks me with its magic over and over. For a whole hour I sit there and go <gasps> <gasps> because the world's so amazing. And then I write down what I actually experience and then I call it fiction so people will not think I'm crazy. <laughs> but how do people experience this world when they're sitting in traffic, going to work, getting yelled at by their boss, trying to pay their bills, uh, their kids are having trouble, and they're sitting there going like, oh my God, I need a self-help book. <laughs> yeah. Why should they read Diana? How can they see themselves in Diana? And how do we become ourselves like she became herself? Okay, because here's the thing, because I, I have a PhD in sociology, right? So if you look at like Freud's time, he analyzed a bunch of people and he said, oh, they're all obsessed with sex because his culture suppressed sex, right? And it's part of natural experience. Where, well, our culture suppresses magic and miracle and they are normal parts of human experience. And that's why we need all the self-help because we're cutting out a part of ourselves. We can embrace our sexuality now, but if a miracle happens to us, we're like, ooh, can't tell that in at parties. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So what I thought, I'll just pull people into this story and they'll start to realize that they are a walking miracle. That they are nature. Sitting in traffic, you are a model of the earth. Your, your veins are the rivers and your mind full of electricity is the lightning. And you know, you are made of the stuff of the earth. You are nature and nature is full of miracles. And all you have to do is notice. And it's everywhere. It's real. Does that resonate? <laughs> <laughs> but who is Diana herself? I mean, th is, can every woman, every man see themselves in Diana? That's the idea. I, my, again, my brilliant daughter calls it a psychography. It's a metaphor for everything that happens in one human mind, male or female. So we all have a part of ourselves that's vulnerable and nur nurturing and kind and t archetypally female. Right. We all have a part of ourselves that is ego, that is striving, that is ambitious, that, it, that wants to show up you know, as an important person. And the book is an example of what happens when one person begins to move toward soul and away from ego. So all of it is inside your own head. 
And, and you talk in the book, Martha talks about what she calls our furies, on my back over here, which is that, that voice inside all of our heads that says, you're not enough, who do you think you are, what are you doing, you're fat, you're old, you're thin, you're gross, whatever, you, you'll they never, never say get that promotion. Thin. They never, never say, say you're thin. <laughs> they never say you're thin, that's true. <laughs> not even to you? They don't even say it to you? Okay, forget it then. But they say everything, right? They say, and you're like that, and you blame it, right, on your siblings, your parents, you blame it on your husband, your ex husband, whomever. You just blame it like, and you can't control it. And you refer to them as the Furies, right. which I think is a really good word for yeah. it. And how do we quiet the Furies? How does the Furies okay. propel her? And how does she learn to manage them? Well, I am going to, spoiler alert, I'm, I'm going to show you. She hasn't finish the book, so I hate, uh, there are all kinds of like surprise twists as far as I'm concerned. So here's the thing, when you get to a certain point of awakening, right. what you realize is that the Furies are screaming at you all the time because they're trying to get your attention to the truth, but the truth is the exact mirror opposite of everything they're saying. So at a certain point, she wakes up to that, and they, s they tell her, you're nothing, and it turns into her mind into your everything. And they tell her, you're, you're an idiot. And it turns into her, in her mind, you're a genius. And instead of the screaming, she hears them begin to sing. So you don't quiet the Furies. You begin to understand what they're trying to tell you. And they become the music of your life that is always loving and encouraging you. That is a great note. What you just heard, everybody can leave here today with all of those things that are going on in your mind and turn them around and use them to your advantage. It's, that's a major pathway to, to awakening. Martha and I had dinner last night, and you talked a lot about the world that we're all inhabiting right here now in 2016, and how you envision a different kind of world yeah. that we can all collaborate in, exist in. And that's one of the things that we try to do with this conversation series, is build to a more what I call collaborative, compassionate, considerate world, right? Right. That's different from the world we live in, and we all have a role in that. Yeah. What kind of world do you envision uh, with all of your work, and what are you trying to bring us all towards? Well, in the book, I talk about getting bewildered. Um, the, the task when we leave what torments us is to become bewildered in the sense of, I don't know what's going on. So you ask me what the world looks like, I, I don't know, I'm bewildered. But then it becomes bewildered. Right. So within each of us, there is a part that has been tamed by our parents, by our religions, by our cultures, and it constricts us in some way. In some ways it's great, and in some ways it's not. And when we go wild, when we find the part of ourselves that is absolutely true to us, and start peeling away all the socialization, then bewilderment changes us into something we cannot imagine. It's like the caterpillar trying to imagine flying. Until you've gone through the transformation, you cannot become the, the thing with wings. And I think our whole culture has reached a point of crisis ecologically, philosophically, and everything. Politically. Where yes, where yes. we can't just be a bigger caterpillar. It's got to become something with wings. It's not going to look like anything in the past. And I'm obsessed with this. <laughs> so, uh, what I, uh, so we're go I'm not going to spoil the book because I hope everybody will buy the book because Martha self published this book, which I think is incredible. <laughs> and, and really a, a very brave and daring leap because she noticed that the publishing companies um, weren't supportive. They didn't um, believe in what she was writing and saying as much as she did. So she said, you know what? I'm going to take this into my own hands, and I'm going to leap. Just like moving to California, she leapt. She had no reason to move here. She had no I idea. I'm coming to see you. Yeah, she's like, I'm going to come and get a place so we can hang out more. I'm like, yeah, right, right, right. And then the next week, she's like, I actually bought this ranch. And I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> it's not, you know, it's like, what? what how, you, you can't do that. I don't know anything about that. And she's like, I did it already. And uh, she was like, I'm going to write this book, and you don't want to publish it? I'm going to do that. So I'm going to start my own boutique publishing company, and I'm going to put this book out. And so far, it's actually, you were saying last night, her most successful book, and she published it herself. And it's been out one day. So I'm hoping, uh, 
and which I think is a real story of bravery. So, but I want to go to the back of the book um, because uh, she has a guide in the back of the book, which is really a guide for life. And um, I want to go, it's her bewilderment, bewilderment guide, which I love because I've always loved what Mary Oliver said is your one wild and precious life. And, uh, you know, we always think of wild and crazy as bad, and I'm a big believer that it's awesome. And, um, and so she walks you through the steps about how to be wild and how to have this guide and how it can take you through your life. And I want to just clip through them. So the first one, which is, I think, in a way, the most difficult, calm all fear. Yeah, all, it sounds impossible, but give us like two little lines so people can begin to calm all fear. Yeah, two words, horse tranquilizers. No, not really. <laughs> um. <laughs> and this is good because you're not necessarily a very calm person, I might add. Yeah, yeah. so okay. like, I think just for her I being able to I used to sit with Maria and go, we have to do something about <laughs> your anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what are we doing? She's like, I don't know. I said, oh, I don't know. <laughs> everybody be cool. <laughs> Let's calm down. I'm like, I'm not calm. Are you calm? <laughs> okay, but so, all right. So that was the first one. Calm all fear. All right, so what? Is, how can people calm? Because we're afraid of everything, well, right? Let's admit it. We're afraid of, you know, messing up. We're afraid of not succeeding, not being a good enough parent, or good enough everything. So that this has to do with the furies, right? So yeah. how do we calm? We're going to walk through the guide now. Well, it's a strange thing, actually. It's so difficult to get there by releasing like my son with Down syndrome, is, it has no fear unless there's a clear and present danger. But for us, I really want to ask you, have you guys ever been to a place where you really seriously thought you were about to die? Anyone? Okay, have you been Whoa. to a place where there was such a catastrophe going on that everything just went silent inside you? Anybody? Okay, that's the only way I got there to begin with. First it was in surgery. I had one of those white light experiences mm -hmm. they talk about. And that was the first time I understood in, since infancy what peace felt like. And this light came and it suffused me and it was so loving and it said, this is how you're supposed to feel in the world. And then I woke up and I'm like, how do I do that? But what, if you go to those moments when you were in such crisis that it just didn't, anxiety was no longer useful. You just needed to be present. Weirdly enough, that's my anchor. So I had my brain mapped, and the only time I was calm was when I imagined skiing on the edge of a cliff in a blizzard with no visibility, because you have to be so present. So w the, the first thing I do every single day, before I get out of bed, I wake up, and I lie there, and I calm my breath, which is really, you know, every culture calms the breath because it, it affects the brain stem, which is deep, which affects everything else. Mm -hmm. And... I wait until my breathing is calm and my heart is calm. And then I go through the day and if there's any rise in my heartbeat, I relax it, I relax it. And it's all being pinned to those moments when I should have been in intense fear, but I was free from this world because I thought I was about to leave it. So, you know, if you haven't had that experience, I encourage you to go out to the freeway today <laughs> and just stand, yeah. No, but you've had yes. those, right? Where right. just, or maybe it's when you just had a child, a time when your body has been through this thing and it takes over and it just goes, no fear, no fear. And you lead from that place. You, and you try live. to live in that place. I spend an hour, okay. once I get up, sitting there and okay. returning to that place. So task number two, yeah. absorb nourishment, not poison. Yep. So you write in the book, um, pay attention to what goes into your body. Yeah, but what goes into your body is partly food and drink and mostly information and thought. Right. And every thought is either slightly poisonous or very poisonous or healing and nourishing. And you can watch it, like watch on television, you watch the political shows and you can feel the poison coming into your body. Yeah. And then you turn and watch something else like one of Maria's podcasts and you can feel the nourishment coming in. And you, you just learn to do that and life becomes a game of warmer, colder and you just go toward warmer. I'm serious. And if yeah. it says buy a ranch, like spend all your money on a ranch, it's like done. 
done. Leap. Leap. Because you're calm. You've nourished mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer that you have to look at all of this holistically, which she talks oh, yeah. about in the second thing. Oh. Number three, which I love, let your meta self move you. Let so your meta self move you. So meta means other or beyond. So I thought one day, oh, we have like a meta self, something bigger and grander and deeper than our minds. And I wrote into my computer meta self, and it auto-corrected to meat self, M-E-A-T, meat. And I thought, we think we're this meat self, and we are not. We are something other. And if you've ever, like, maybe had a couple of drinks and been at a club or a wedding and felt yourself start to dance without inhibition... That was who you really are. <laughs> That's who you really are, is the part of you that dances with no inhibition when the music moves. And you can live, you can go through your whole day like that dancer. Now, how do you do that? You work in a business, you're in a corporate job. They don't bring that out in you. That is not <laughs> what people think is like, oh, wow, look at her. I'm look not at him, <laughs> right? And so the institutions... Uh, that we exist in, right, that people work in, that their kids go to school in, um, and a particularly in a city like this, right? Yeah. It's hard to do that. You say that, but you are so full of it because <laughs> I have watched you. I have walked into this very room right. when it was empty, and you were like, what am I doing? Everybody be cool! <laughs> and, <laughs> and I said, you, we had this conversation in the office just now. You know exactly what you're doing, and you always have. Your mind second guesses it. But you have been moved by that other self since the day I met you because it is so strong in you. And that's why all these people are here. No, they're here for you. But anyway, <laughs> we could just. No, but I think that for people who are, you know, in businesses that don't, you know, in workplaces that don't feed that, that don't honor that, it's really hard. So I yeah. I'm wondering, and they're, you know, they're living paycheck to paycheck. Yep. They're, you know, up against the wall like Diana, right? Yep. She's in this kind of terrible job in the beginning of the um, book and, you know, kind of a ho-hum going through life, which is what so many people feel. So how do we get, if someone finds themselves in that place, to get beyond that? So this is why the tasks go in order. Right. And you can't jump up. They're dependent on each other. So if you're in the office, like you're working at a, a horrible, horrible place, and you go into your office, first, it, the place is full of fear. And you've got to find a place in you that has no fear. And then you start to feel what aspects of the job are truly poison for you. And it could be that the job is so poisonous you have to leave. But it could you be... you have to leap. You have to leave. But it could be that some aspects of it are nourishing. Like Brooke Castillo here came into my life when I was working with some people who were pretty toxic. And she said, no, but there's good here. We're going to take the toxicity out. We're going to build on what's nourishing. And um, it totally changed my life. And she was able to like discern. And that's what my CEO does now. I mean, I, p the people I work with have that skill. And if you bring it to an office, I don't care if you're the mail clerk. People like the energy of it, and they begin to sort of resonate with that, and things begin to get better. I also believe that changing yourself, even if you're in a toxic place, you change your energy. Absolutely. People begin to notice it, and even if you're not the CEO of wherever you are, um, you can impact uh, just by your energy and by changing yourself, the environment around you, yeah. whether that be in your home or in your office space. Yep. Okay, so now we're, uh, we're letting our meta self move us. You connect your hearts to all hearts. Yeah. So explain, that's task number four. And these are things we're supposed to be doing on a daily basis. Supposed to is a rough term. Okay, we, ca we get the opportunity <laughs> to do. We no, 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 no. It's, it's what it is. It's like saying you get to have a delicious breakfast every day. Because mm -hmm. if you get to that place where you're moving like a dance and you're moving towards what's nourishing, you start to realize that your meta self is also everyone else's <laughs> meta self, right. including like animals and things. So I first started to experience this in Africa where I would uh, encounter wild animals. Mm -hmm. And then I realized it was every animal. And then I realized it was every living thing. And then I realized it was even inanimate objects, and it's a feeling of 
expansion out of the small self and it's this intense love mm -hmm. that is and Jesus talked about it that you know the right hand and the left hand are on the same team they're not separate we are not separate beings we are all parts of one soul that loves itself because it's made of love and you start to experience that and it literally in your chest you can feel a melting opening sensation and it's actually terrifying because it makes you very vulnerable yeah and that's when you lean in and your heart will get broken in this world and then it will heal and it just gets stronger and stronger every time you open it instead of so that's a really another great point your heart will get broken in this world you will experience loss pain, grief, and then you will come out. Yep, you heal strong in the broken places. So some people don't come out. Nope, not. Some people, and I think that's worth, like what is it that you think why some people seem to come out stronger, more vulnerable, wiser, more full of illumination, and others just give up? What is the ingredient? They don't do the tasks. Task one, get rid of your fear. So if your heart breaks and you're not rid of fear, you will close down forever. You can't tolerate that kind of pain. You are never going to let it in again. And guess what? You're going to live there forever. So you have to get rid of your fear. And then you have to see what's good and what's poison. And you have to, like, you have to okay. do it all in order. And then the heart just keeps breaking open, breaking open. Task number five, yes. tell the truth. Oh, that little thing. That, <laughs> that little thing. So Martha has been, you can talk about that, but she, you have talked a lot to me anyway about being on this integrity cleanse, and um, which I thought was a really great uh, idea, only telling the truth, only being in, in integrity and checking yourself on a day-to-day -day basis with people instead of saying like, oh, I can't make it tonight to your event because I've got X. Actually just saying, I can't make it. Yeah. Or I don't want to And they come. say, why can't you? And you say, I don't want to. Right. <laughs> and, and what happens is it starts to change, it starts to create around you the world you always wanted. Yes, you offend people. Yes, people get, they leave. But the people who are offended by your truth were never your people. So they all leave and then all these people come in who, and you're telling them the exact truth and they're cool with it. And uh, suddenly, it w I was telling you, you know, my, more, my family isn't so big on me after I sort of told my truth about my religion and all that. So I have all these empty slots for family. <laughs> and then, then I s meet people like you and I'm like, I have a place for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, she did, yeah. <laughs> yeah? I'm at the table, yeah. <laughs> 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 and it is a wild table. <laughs> it's yeah. a fun table. <laughs> it's a really interesting table. Okay, so uh, it's a truth-telling table, right? So task number six, let your meta self flow through you. Through your mind. Through this your is mind. the thing. You give your, you give your action, you, as you may have noticed, we are going up the chakras. So the, the root chakra is, the, is fear, the snake, the reptile brain. The gut is whether you taste it, is it poisonous or nourishing? Then the solar plexus is where all the limbs come out, that's your action. Heart, moving up to that. Telling the truth is the throat chakra. And then there's the mind. And the hardest thing for our culture to do is to allow your mind to relax and flow something new into the world that has never been thought before. And that's what you and I've been talking about forever, and we had talked about it again five minutes ago, because I watch you try to think through what you're doing, mm -hmm. and it's not thought. And then when you actually relax, you have these ideas that are like kapow, illuminating, kapow. And that's because you're releasing your thought process to something deeper and more beautiful and more powerful than thought. But it's a tricky one. That's a tricky one. Yeah. And so you have to then get calm. Well, you have to get calm first. You have to get calm it, first. Uh, you can get yourself a little necklace like this to remind yourself of the order <laughs> in which you have to do them. Because, oh. by the way, people who have done tasks, it, like they focus on the mind without fearlessness, have created all the war, all the holocausts, all the genocides, all the terrorism. It's mind without love. And it, it is a horror. So flip it. Flip it. Flip it, just like the thoughts. Flip it. Yep. And finally, number seven, right? 
Notice that you are all for all always. Yeah, that was, it was a very interesting thing to me. I went to the forest and didn't know what I would find there and what I was supposed to do, and I just went out. And um, I, this is where language absolutely fails. There are these moments, you know, when two chipmunks are fighting on your lap and there are birds on your shoulders and a deer drinking right in front of you. And you're calm. And you're, <laughs> you've got to be really calm for that oh, to really? happen. Okay. <laughs> Suddenly you, you know, you look at the little bird on your knee and this tiny little creature is looking up at you and you realize it's, it's this big. But the love coming from this animal fills the universe. And you realize there ca there's not a single part of the universe that is not the love of that tiny bird. I am it. It is me. As Nisargadatta says, I yeah, quote so him. Talk, to, uh, no, it's mention that quote at the back of the book because I think it kind of encapsulates. Yeah. Really, it's, a, it's kind of a life philosophy. Yeah, one of my favorite dudes, Nisargadatta Maharaj, wrote, when I look within myself and see that I am nothing, that is wisdom. When I look around myself and see that I am everything, that is love. Between these two, my life turns. Between nothing and everything. Yeah. Love and wisdom. Flowing. Nothing and everything. Yeah. I want to kind of take off from that and that talk about something that we've spoken about and that I've been kind of writing about is that we live in a world where everybody's asking you every day, what are you doing, right? What's your job? What are you doing? And I always thought that it was kind of the in many ways, the impetus for the women's movement, everybody ran out of the house because they didn't feel that answering that I'm a mother was enough, right? And then obviously now everybody's doing it because they financially need to do it, but it's that we're constantly kind of assigning ourselves titles so that we feel worthy and that we feel like we're someone and therefore we hope somebody will speak to us, right? And um, I wrote about this conversation that I had with Sandra Day O'Connor two weeks ago when I, well, a week ago, when I went to accept the award in her name that she had nominated me for, and she was peppering me, what are you doing? What are you doing these days that's significant, she said to me, and I clipped through kind of everything that I was doing. She said, but what else are you doing? You're not doing anything significant. And I was like, oh, and I was telling her that I was like, I thought my mother had come back from the <laughs> grave, and I was like, what the hell, you know? And I was like, well, I'm doing this, and I'm doing this, and I'm, she goes, but what else, what else? And I said, oh, and, and then, then I'm you know, trying to solve Alzheimer's, I'm trying to do gender-based research, and she goes, but you've been working on that a while, you haven't done it, and I was like, I, I was just like, OMG, this, I was like, oh, well, I am. She goes, come back to, you should ha have that done within a year. And I'm like, well, uh, uh, you know, she goes, last time I talked to you, you were still doing that. And I'm like, well, yeah, but I, and, and so everything I said to her that I was doing from my mothering to these conversations, to my website, to my blog, to my work at NBC, I was going through all of this. And she's like, mm -hmm, what else, what else? And I was just like, huh. And then I looked her dead in the eye and I said, you know what I'm really doing? And she goes, no, what? And I said, uh, I'm working on myself from the inside out. I'm trying to make myself strong. And she looked, and I was like, oh my God, I got you, I got you. I was like, I shut you up for one second. <laughs> and um, she was like, hmm, that's interesting, and squeezed my hand. And I think that I was kind of embarrassed to say it, and kind of, you know, and I said, and I, I said, that's actually the most significant thing I'm doing. And then my brother responded to me, he's like, you know, Maria, the most significant thing is that you already are, but you don't believe it. That's what you need to do. And yeah. so I was talking to Martha, and I was saying, you know, we put up on the thing, you know, Martha Beck, life coach and author. But that's not who Martha is. Just like I'm not, a, you know, a journalist. We put all these things, I'm doing this, this, and but that's not who I am. How do you complete, and not if Sandra Day O'Connor were sitting here asking <laughs> you, what are you doing that's significant? Um, uh, but... I am, I told her this was a trick question because every day when I meditate, I use Nisargadatta's uh, mantra, which is I am, just simply I am. And as if you sit with that for an hour or two, just I am, I am, what happens is that the self di dissolves completely and becomes everything. And really, if you ask me, I would say what I hope to be is an aperture into stillness. That, uh, that when people come toward me, they 
they cease to see anybody and see their own stillness and just fall into that with all of us. And there's no, I don't want any worldly labels at all anymore. I don't I hardly have any clothes anymore. I'm like <laughs> done. Seriously. So it's, it's, you know, so how does that, like you're sitting at a dinner table and someone says to you, what are you doing these days? And you're saying, I'm an aperture <laughs> into stillness. I, I, I love that. I'm on an integrity cleanse. I have to tell the truth. So I think that's, a, you know, have you ever said, I don't think you've ever said that at a table. No, not at, not at a table. But at, uh, you just said it poor. here. I am an aperture. Well, I hope to be. I, I mean, that feels kind of like hubris to me. Um, I, a, another one that I actually do say is, I am a servant of the transformation of consciousness. And I know that sounds <laughs> new age and everything, but that is my life from the time I was, I, I remember being the night before my fourth birthday, lying there thinking, I have got to get more done. I've been here four years, I have nothing. <laughs> Cause I have no anxiety. Um, and I knew I was here to help with something. And as I got older, I, I, I knew it was some sort of change. And now I think it's a transformation of human consciousness that will, actually embrace the world in a, do, a new kind of energy. And if you, if you nail me down, I'll tell you, I live to be a servant of that transformation, period. So is that something that we could all, like everybody leaves here and says, you know, we, we live in a world now where everybody's like, what's your brand? What's your brand? You know, what's your brand? What's your brand? And everybody's like, and you know, people have said, what's your brand? I'm like, uh, 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 I'm not sure. Like, you know, it's, I think, how do people answer that in the world that we live in, where everybody wants to know who we are and what we're doing. I can't tell you for anyone but myself, and I really do believe that when you go wild, you will have your own answer. But when people ask me that, and I really do this because I am genuinely on an integrity cleanse, I just look at them and I say, I don't care. <laughs> they say, what are you? I don't care. I respectfully do not care. I do not give a single crap. Not a crap is given. I don't care. I am a person who gets up, puts on galoshes over my pajamas, and runs into the woods. I've seen that. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. That's true. I do not care what you think I am. My kids said to me when I go up to visit Martha, they're like, what do you do up there? <laughs> like, what's going on up there? I'm like, I don't know. We run through the hills <laughs> in our pajamas. Like, I don't know what's going on up there, but it's okay. <laughs> but I think that obviously people that are here, I think, you know, are here really, I think, you know, they could be anywhere, right? And they came here because there's somewhere inside of them their longing for this yeah. world, they want to live in a different place yeah. than perhaps, you know, society is asking us all to live. Yeah. I certainly feel that way. So how do they know that, and you have to be like a little wild to think like that, maybe even people say you're a little crazy or new agey or whatever it is. How do you kind of take all of this and go out to your place of business or to the dinner tonight where you're, you know, going and not feel like you're like weird? I don't care if people think I'm weird. I don't care if I feel like I'm weird. I am what I am. I can't lie about it anymore. And when people, it's like you're saying there's a society of caterpillars, and I don't mean this in a valuative sense, but the butterfly lands and the caterpillars say, I've been e I have eaten seven leaves today. What have you done? And the <laughs> butterfly just looks at the caterpillar and goes, I'm so proud of you for eating seven leaves today. You keep eating. Yo, what are you? I'm somebody who's here to love you. You know, I can't explain wings to you. I mean, and that sounds, again, like I'm putting myself above, but it's more that I've, I'm free. I'm more free. What does freedom feel like to you? <sighs> <sighs> there are, n well, it's freedom from language, for one thing. It, it, you know how people have flying dreams? And you wake up and you think, that's supposed to be true. <laughs> It's when you have flying dreams every day wide awake that you're free. Not, it doesn't matter. I mean, I've had people threaten to kill me. I've had people threaten, and it just, I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'm not afraid anymore, and that means I'm free. That's such a great uh, thing. We were also talking last night about 
the importance, and I think everybody in this is be a great piece of insight from you for everybody in this room, the importance of play in our life. Yeah. And we, you know, as we get older and we have all these responsibilities, financial, in every way, how do we incorporate play into our lives? The biggest leap of faith people have to take these days is an economic leap from the old grindstone model, which, by the way, is falling apart. As there are fewer and fewer jobs to be had, more and more people are clawing for them. It is rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. I'm a sociologist by training. It's going down, okay? The economic model is going down. The leap of faith is that you can become wild and the world will sustain you. And I can't generalize that experience. What I've seen, I like to compare it to, a, there's a tsunami of change coming in, a tidal wave. And people are running into these big structures. I'll get a job and then I'll be safe. And the tsunami comes and they all get swept away or drowned. And then I, I show people a video of that. And then I show them a surfer on a wave that turns out to be a monster, seven stories high. Mm -hmm. and here's this guy, he's out naked on a piece of wood. <laughs> and this thing comes down on him like the wrath of God. God, and he comes flying out of there, and it's the time of his life. The, the challenge is, do you dare leave the building and run out there naked? And that's why I could not publish this book the ordinary way, because I couldn't like hang on to an old structure. Oh, I'll get a publisher, that'll help. I had to say, no, I'm going to do it my way. Every single thing has to feel and taste and, and touch. It all has to feel like food for me, not poison. Oh, yeah. No, and, and she drew this. I painted it, really. She painted this, which um, is really quite amazing. You get to see it. She's yeah. an incredible painter. And there's going to be a coloring book. Yeah, I'm making a coloring this, book. Which is also, I'm a big believer. She gave me for my birthday. And my birthday this year, I got a basket for a little child. And I was like, Who, who's having a baby? And I was like, that's so weird. Is someone having a baby? And then it was, Patty goes, it's for you. I was like, <laughs> for me? And I opened it, it was all this baby stuff from her for me. And it was all childlike. And uh, it was coloring books and crayons and snugglies and kind of. And uh, you were saying that in the book, she uses the term beloved all the time in the conversation and little girl. And that you were saying that really nobody that are the way we're raised in society and even now wants to be, quote, a little girl. Yeah, and that the lowest uh, position in the society. And you want it elevated. And, and that is, you know, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. The, that, that, that thing I quoted earlier, wait without thought for you are not ready for thought. Then it goes on. And so the darkness shall be the light and the stillness the dancing. Everything gets reversed. So literally, I started drawing when I was 10 months old. And I thought oh I'd Oh, stop it. I did. Ten months old. Yeah. And then I was going to be an artist, and then I lost the use of my hands for 12 years. And so for me, as I start making these coloring books, I'm like, I am literally five years old, except without all the, the abuse. <laughs> I'm just like coloring. That's a whole different book. Um, <laughs> so I'm coloring away, and I'm feeling like a tiny little kid. And then I call you. I'm like, Maria, I'm making a cuttering book. And you tell me, oh, I just talked to a woman from the Home Shopping Network who says right. that coloring books are like the big thing now. That's right. So the very thing, if I, I'm going to stop doing any job at all. And I'm going to lie on the floor and draw pictures of pigs. And then you tell me, well, that's where the money is. <laughs> 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 you know, I mean, take. You've got to take the leap, and I've coached so many people, and the ones that are afraid to jump from the plane, I'm just going to hold on to a bungee cord. The parachute can't open. But if you really jump, it opens. And finally, before we open it up to questions, I think you know so many people that I talk to uh, these days are going, what do you think is going on in the world? This election, businesses, it's a, such a scary time. And you listen to the rhetoric on both sides, in this election and people, are, it's so angry, it's so divisive, it's now looking like female versus male, black versus white, Latino versus, you know, men. I mean, it's just like a mess. And how do we, you know, break through that? How do we leap? Um, I think really by saying, I don't care about being safe. Yeah. Right? And I used to think, oh my gosh, we got to get ourselves together and then we got to unite and go out and fight the good fight and all that. 
But now I realize that nature works in fractal forms. And a fractal is like an equation that recreates itself not exactly, but similarly. It's called pattern disorder, and a fern will unfold into like from a tiny bud into a huge, gorgeous thing. And what we have to do is create ourselves as a fractal of what is awake. And around us, without our effort, the world begins to mirror that. So the Buddha's last words were, make of yourself a light. If you make of yourself a light, Everything, it's like bringing a candle into a dark room. If you bring an unlighted candle into a light room, the candle has no power to make it dark. But if you bring a lighted candle into a dark room, the darkness loses. It is illuminated. So you, there's not a lot as, eff as much effort as I thought. If you do the little tasks, you'll be taken to the right place at the right time to go play with your friends in a way that lights a candle in the room and the darkness is doomed. There it is, in, in that order, to do these steps, to see yourself, so when everybody's screaming and yelling, whether it's in your home or you know, at a dinner table or at a party, talking about the election, how bad this person, be a light, just keep coming back to yourself, be a light, be an illuminator, elevate, see yourself. Shine, right? just shine. And one of the things that Martha does also is she goes to Africa every year and you know you take people with you, but you also do all this good works, which is there are books, uh, jewelry over here, and she has this foundation that works uh, in Africa to um, help make the land sustainable and to work with women who have been abused. And it's called the Mother Love Project. And that uh, part of it is, I I'm not in charge of it. It's my wonderful African friends, but we, we band together. And that's what happens when you make of yourself a light. You'll see other lights, and they may be across the world, and you'll come together. And so we saw what these people were doing, and we thought, geez, let's get some American like funding into this. Because they literally started by building a, a preschool out of bricks that they made with a borrowed brick maker and the dirt that was under their feet. And now they're educating and healing and adopting and nurturing thousands of lives in rural Africa and, and restoring ecosystems to their wild state. And, and then by doing that, they restore to themselves. So now we're going to open up to questions because everybody came out early. So if people have questions about the guide, about Diana herself, about Martha herself, go ahead. Hi. I have a lot of theories. <laughs> so <laughs> flipping that, how, how do you um, embrace the opposite side of the mirror without arrogance? And how, how do arrogance and ego... Like, how does that, how does that Yeah, that's what the whole book is um, about. It's about how the ego tries to come back in and all that. But what, are, what do your furies say? Uh, like, what's your top, <laughs> one of your top five? You're stupid. <laughs> okay. So you can find a place where that's true. And you can acknowledge that. But you have to give equal time to the other evidence. You know, when I was trained in statistics, if I'd done that kind of sample, if I only looked at one side, as a journalist, if she only looked at one side, that's not true. So are there times when you've been a genius? And I don't mean generally. I want you to think of specific moments when you did something really brilliant. Um, kind, yeah, but in okay. the, yeah. Now, do you hear how you went, yeah, but, but, but. You gave it this much time. And what you do is you sit down with it for an hour and you rivet your attention on the time when you did something by God right. And it doesn't make you arrogant. It's the fear of not being enough that makes you puff up. Once you know you're enough, you're, you just sit there and shine on other people. That's what, that's what I love about Maria. She just sits around shining on other people. She gives all the attention to other people, and the more she does that, the brighter she shines. So it, it's the opposite of arrogance. It's the truth. That's all. You just have to give it equal time. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, uh, I want to ask you about teenage depression and suicide. Mm -hmm. I work with a lot of middle school and high schoolers, and the other yeah. day we were having a conversation around a popular book, and it's about this girl that kills herself. Mm. And the most jubilant little girl in that group said, well, in seventh grade I tried to kill myself a couple times, 
And I know those stats are up. Mm -hmm. So what is your, it's how can we help them? I really believe that it's about them knowing that they're meant to be wild and being put in a cage. So that we now know brain research shows that the optimal way for a child to learn is outside in nature, moving all five senses active, solving problems on their own for real situations. Instead, we take our children and we put them in airless boxes where they are shamed for not knowing the answers the teacher already knows. It is stupid. It was designed to create factory workers, and it kills them. And as their wildness dies, the heart shatters, and all they see in the future is more of that. Of, I was suicidal, too, at that age. And it took my son, Adam, with Down syndrome, where I said, well, he's never, who cares where he goes to school? And then I was like, wait a second, who cares where anyone goes to school? So just to have someone say to you at that age, I know what you're going through, and they're putting you in a cage, and you are wild inside, and I see you, and they're, we're going to let you free someday. Count on it. That, I've done that. I did that with tons of my, like, like my kids' friends as they went through junior high and high school. I know you've done similar things. But I think also to the point is that we can begin, as we say, architects of change, architects build and tear down, build yep. and tear down. And you can start building the world for that person today. Building, <laughs> giving them the book, giving her the book, giving her the guide, giving her the freedom, the permission to be wild. So that, you know, y and you could say, look at I have a friend, I went to a thing and she's, I don't know how old, but she still thinks she's stupid. <laughs> yep, right? She thinks she's stupid at this. So the sooner we can turn you to tell, teach you to turn that around, or she can come and y seriously and talk about how she's learning to change it. And maybe if someone had given her that message when she was in seventh grade, how it might be different, right? Go ahead. So I went to a, a talk a couple months ago with, with a friend. It was a CNN anchor was launching a book. And it was a Beltway crowd, and we go, and everyone's asking her, so what do you do? And she says, well, I'm a mom. Mm -hmm. And every time she said it, I could tell she felt two feet tall. People right. walked away from us. Um, the funny thing is, she's a, a wonderful mother, a philanthropist in town, throws fundraisers for all her kids' schools. Uh -huh. And touching on this question, like when can we get to a point where we're proud of saying, I'm a mom, especially when I hear more and more women starting to scale back in their careers when their kids hit that tween, kind of like Anne Marie Sl Slaughter, who was here in October. Right. Yeah. She started to scale back. Like, when will we get to a point where I'm a mother is a good thing and people don't walk away from you? There is nothing to be done outside yourself. When my son was still inside me, and I was reading about Down syndrome because he'd been diagnosed. I had one book that said, prepare to be ashamed for the rest of your life every time they see you with your child. And I took the book, I was 25 years old, and I threw that book at the wall so hard that it exploded. And I thought, I, I refuse to be ashamed of my child. And uh, so his whole life I was like, here he is. I'd put little Harvard shirts on him, like, <laughs> deal with it. <laughs> and I, I refuse to be ashamed of him. He is perfect. He is magic. He is a superhero. And I am so proud of him. And I've watched people recoil, and I don't give a damn. I just respectfully do not care. And so I don't, I don't have to change society. I've changed me. And then you watch people start to fractal around it. Yeah. I think the other point to that is, um, as Martha was saying earlier, if people don't get you, they're not meant to be in your tribe. Yeah. They're not meant. And that is kind of coming back to, you know, well, that person that turned away, instead of going after them and trying to convince them that you are yes. someone, it's to go, they're not supposed to be in my space. And that's particularly hard in this place, right, where it's yeah. like everybody's, got, you know, trying to get in a VIP line, they're trying to be someone all the time, and I know a lot of those people, and they don't feel like someone. Yeah. Just FYI. <laughs> no, so. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. Well, no, one of the things it. is that our, the whole way our culture set that up, you're supposed to know for the indefinite future. You know, people told me as a professor, get tenure and then you'll be secure. And then they started firing tenured professors. And I've been through that, 18 months of living on debt with three little kids and no job and 
you know, I want to be a writer now. And it didn't happen for a very long time. What you start to realize, though, is it's not a rock that lands on you. It's a river that flows. And as you open, you find, and I can't know for you, but I've watched so many people where it's, for me, it was this little job that's doing an, an assistant teaching thing, and then it was that little bit of money, and then it was this little opportunity, and a little more debt, and then suddenly, okay, now a book starts to sell. And as you change the way you relate to the world, I mean, this is where the magic part comes in. As your heart starts to fall in love with the world, I, I worked with a person who worked with Gandhi, and she told me, you would not believe how much money it took to keep Gandhi poor. <laughs> because as he attracted so much love, everybody was throwing money at him, and he wanted, he's like, I am a diaper man for peace, you know? I, <laughs> and so they had to like, deflect all this money, and it took a huge staff of people to do that. And, uh, you know, I heard my, my partner Karen saying on, to her mother at tax time on the phone, she's like, yeah, our taxes are, like, we, we're doing quite well. And then I hear a pause, and then she says, I don't know what she does. She just sits in the forest covered with birds. <laughs> <laughs> I, and honestly, I'm just like, really? I go to Bridget, my CEO, really? There's still money? Who knew? <laughs> You know, like, I never expected to make money with this book. That was never my intention. It's already in the black, but once you relax into the world, the world loves you, and so you are learning to relax, but it's, it's that l calming fear, calming fear. When the fear is gone, bang, the connection starts to happen, and everything lifts you. And you That's watch uh, what happens to Diana, right, when she loses her job and leaps and... I think uh, the other thing that I think is really interesting in the book without going through it is the, the man there, right? You, it, sometimes you have to come up against something that breaks you open, right? That there's somebody there or something there that's actually that you think is like, oh my God, oh my God, but it's actually your teacher, right? Yeah. It's your turning point. Yeah, if you can't go effortlessly into the trust that the world will support you, your fear will get bigger and bigger and bigger so that it becomes unbearable. And when it, when it is so unbearable that you feel like you truly can't stand it and you just put it aside for a minute, and you're just like, I can't even think about that. <sighs> and then suddenly a miracle happens and things start to happen and you're like, oh good, and you cling to it. And this is sort of her relationship in the book, The Heroine with her boyfriend. She, as she clings, everything goes wrong. <laughs> And when she relaxes, everything begins to flow. So that would be my advice. Start with the first task. Be wilderment. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so d two years ago, or a little less, about a year and a half ago, I had um, a rebirth from a stem cell rescue. Wow. So I was given a terrible... Um, prognosis of a cancer that was 98% mortality. Oh, wow. And it took the moment of holding that to realize I could go there or I could go to the 2%. Right. I could be part of, not the 1%, but the 2% <laughs> um, that could look at, at the situation I was in from a life perspective instead of a death perspective. Mm. What I realized to your point is it wasn't just me that had to sort of sit with that and be the I am now in that space. And, and my question to you is the effect of my circumstance on others, what was hard is when they weren't where I was. Mm -hmm. So the effect of, oh my gosh, we're going to lose her. Mm -hmm. And me, oh my gosh, I'm going to make it. Yep. There was that, that space in between. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's hard to stay wild. In. Yeah, and that's what happens in the book. She goes wild, and then she hits a circumstance that hits all her old triggers of fear, and, and like this is all bull crap, and it's not really true. And she has to see through that illusion again. But it only happens to her twice in the book. In our lives, it can happen again and again and again. And I would just repeat the Buddha phrase, make of yourself a light. And you did, and you held it, 
and people brought their darkness and you shone through it. Tell me where I'm wrong. <laughs> I have hair. <laughs> I think um, t to that point, the gulf that kind of exists, right, between the I am and we're going to lose it, whatever those, that river is. Um, I noticed that most of this crowd uh, is female, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and uh, thank you, gentlemen who are here. And um, one of the things I have tried to do myself is to figure out how to bring more and more men into these Architects of Change live conversations uh, tell them about our principles, because uh, I think, you know, and we've even seen playing out in the presidential, man versus woman, you know, how do we move from that? How can each person in this room, whether it, you know, invite men in, invite other people in so that the river between the sexes, uh, the genders, gets a little narrower? Well, you may notice at the very bottom of this, it says book one. There are three <laughs> books. It's a trilogy. And the first one is about how the divine feminine wakes up because the feminine has been discarded. It's a little girl thrown on a trash bin. And as it wakes up, it is wild. It's outside of the culture that's been created. Men, because they created the culture and are more identified with it, are more trapped in it. So if I tell a woman you need to quit your soul murdering job. She goes home and she tells her husband and he goes, we'll make it, honey, it's okay, most men. And then if I tell a male client, you need to quit your soul murdering job, he goes home and says, honey, I'm gonna quit. No, he's gotta fight his wife, his mother, his father, everything. So the job of the feminine is to free itself and then to free men. So the second book, that whole thing of the princess I and love the power. Let's, let's pause a second yeah. with that. Because that's that we, we talk a lot about feminine power, the divine feminine, and my daughter said to me, well, <laughs> give me an example of you know, feminine power. You know, is it angry, is it this? So let's talk about free yourself and then free the men. Yeah, it can be so simple. My daughter really helped me write this book. And right a few months ago, his company folded and he lost his job. And um, I went into a mild panic because I don't want to support them. And um, I was like, uh, I hope he gets another job. And my <laughs> daughter said, no, he needs to rest. He needs to rest and then he needs to find out what he loves and then he needs to go wild. And I was like. <laughs> <laughs> he needs to pay the bills. <laughs> exactly. And I realized I was doing it. I was trapping yeah. this beautiful, beloved man and in, in the next book, he's at the top of a tower that the, you know, the prince has to save the princess from the tower. In the next book, there's a man caught in the top floor of a penthouse office in Manhattan, and he's waiting to be set free. All the wildness has been pounded out of him, and he doesn't even know where to start. And it's the, it's the women who already get outside of that because we've pushed outside it, we can then bring wildness back in, and as the structures collapse, we say to the men, as we've said to my son-in-law, sweetheart, rest. You too get to play this game of trust the universe and it will care for you. And if necessary, the women in your lives will gather around you and love you until you're whole, and we believe in you. Don't poison yourself again on our behalf. And, and so we're doing that. We're, we're telling him. Don't look for a job. Heal. We want you whole. That's a really good message for anybody who works with young women, right, to begin to, you know, uh, give that over. Because that we have to work against our furies of what we want to lock men into, right? You have to do this. You have to be that. We kind of look at, like, the archetype of the man, right? Yeah. And try being inside a man's head when he wants to go away from the standard. The furies in his head will kick the crap out of him. I mean, it's gnarly, right? Do I lie? Do I lie, guys? <laughs> if you're not a man, be a man! Right. It's tough. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Martha? Go ahead. Hi. Um, so I 
lived the wildlife for about five years. I moved to Mexico, taught yoga on the beach in Tulum. I mean, I got my Mexican work visa all to, you know, to um, embrace my wild self. And uh, then I went to another retreat center that burned down in a wildfire. And now I'm back in L.A. um, And I'm contemplating nursing school so that I never have to deal with uncertainty yeah beware of stereotypes I'm so glad you brought this up sweetie because you do not wild does not necessarily look like a yoga studio in Mexico wildness can be you sitting here in a chair wildness can be Maria creating a website wildness can be a man a CEO of a major multinational corporation we've had those people come to my ranch and I've seen them set themselves free And we are given the positions in society that we hold for a reason, and it is to bring wildness into everything, to make the whole damn thing go wild. You don't have to go running on the beach in a peasant blouse (laughs) to be wild. You have to live according to love and wisdom and make of yourself a light, and you can literally do that anywhere, the way Mandela did it in prison. You can do it. But I think probably in there is a feeling of failure in that, right? I wanted to be wild and didn't work out, right? I, I failed, right? Like, it's the, I'm stupid, I'm failure, like, what was that all about? God, that's embarrassing, right? Turn it around, what's, the op- what's your worst fury? What does it say? My worst fury is you're gonna be like homeless and alone if you can't. So let's turn it, so how does that feel in your body? Does that feel like poison or like food? It feels horrible. It's poison. Don't swallow it. Okay. <laughs> the opposite. What? Say it again. I'll be homeless and alone. So what's the opposite of homeless and alone? I'll have everything I need. Surrounded by amazing just community. I'm going home to my loved ones. Yeah. That's, what's hap- that's what the Furies are trying to get you to understand. That's the real truth. How, what, does that feel like food or like poison? It feels great. And eat it. One of the things also that some people from who've come to these Architects of Change live conversations have started doing is kind of gathering in their homes. They, the a girl was in here the other day and she's like, can I start Architects of Change at home? And I want to do it with my daughters and we talk about, because we have principles and we talk about this kind of stuff. So I think sometimes a lot of us feel like, oh, you know, you come to something, you feel all good, right? And then you're like, you have to wait, you know, six months or I mean we try to do these now twice a month I was saying to Martha we originally thought we would do them once a month that we could be doing them almost every day Um, but people can do them themselves right you can follow the guide you can look at the principles for the architects of change live and what you're really the opposite of alone is community yeah right and this is a hard town everybody's isolated they're on their computers I have my youngest son is graduating uh, in six weeks, and I'm like, I'm alone, I'm gonna be alone, oh my <laughs> God, I'm 60 and alone. And uh, so, and my daughter's like, you're not gonna be alone, mommy, I swear, you know, we're gonna come back, I'm like, it's not the same, oh my God, I'm a disaster. <laughs> and so I have this whole fury going, you know, like, what, blah, blah. and, um, but I think we're all looking for community, right? So you meet one or two people, like, let's start that. That's what I used to always think, like the AA community, and yeah. I, I have a friend, my best friend who's in that, and I keep going, can I come? She goes, you can't come in here. You're not so a belong in here. <laughs> like, I, I always say, well, I'll say I'm an addict. I'm some kind of addict. I know I am. She's like, get out. You don't belong in here. And I'm like, I like because you have that thing to go to at night. You can go there. And she goes, Maria, go start your own thing, right? Like, you don't belong in here. And by the way, that's one thing that You're my... codependent. Go to another thing. <laughs> go to a codependency group. <laughs> go to Al-Anon. But you can't go to any of them because you're not a non. You can never be a non. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we... Th- I did a call and I trained a whole bunch of my coaches to run what I call bewilderment book clubs. But really, it's an excuse to form community and to create that impulse of fractaling in groups and then in crowds and then in populations because I think the world is ready to wake up. You know, it's time. It's time. Uh, I don't know how we're doing on time, but it's like, okay, go ahead. Hi. Yeah.
Yeah. If your loved ones are afraid because everyone's being pushed off a cliff, it is your absolute responsibility to learn to fly and learn fast and then let <laughs> them see you do it. So it's integrity within and then it's telling the truth to them. Life devastates us all because it wants us all to wake up. And if you think your kids should be spared from pain, then you're telling them to be immune to awakening. Good work. <laughs> I'm proud of you. <laughs> okay, oh, let, we'll take one more question. Oh. Go ahead. Um, I know you've been doing this work for a long time, at, and I have as well, and I'm just curious, are you seeing, I'm seeing with my clients and with myself in the recent months and maybe six months, a real almost tectonic pl uh, change. Are you feeling that energetically where, where I'm seeing a lot of uh, people really being called to silence? Mm -hmm. Yeah. To silence, to really sit in the silence, and w it's, which is so hard for us because we're doers. And are, are, are you feeling that as well? Oh, a couple of years ago, it was like, if I don't start meditating for hours at a time, I'm going to kill someone. I mean, I like, I started to get so hungry for it. So it's not a discipline for me. Mm. The more you suffer, the more the stillness calls to you and everything um, longs to take you in to peace. And I, there's one thing, I've worked with serial killers, I've worked with heroin addicts, I've worked with people everywhere in the world and the one thing everyone knows is true is that they are meant to be in peace. And it is peace that calls to everyone. Call it silence, call it stillness, call it light. Yeah, yeah, I feel it. So I want to um, wrap this up. I was saying to Martha in there, I think there's a huge community for her to come back to Los Angeles. Um, and as I reminded her last night, she thinks it's really far away where she lives and it's a car ride she can drive down here. And, and this community of you know, architects of change, people who are bewilderment, be wild, uh, it's one and the same. And I think your message is so powerful and I think we can uh, support it by buying this incredible book, Diana Herself. And that's really all of us, change your name, herself, right? So we don't have to say I'm a mother, I'm a this, I'm a that. I'm Maria herself, Martha herself, John himself. And that that's where we're going. And even if it feels like the antithesis of what's going on politically or what's going on economically, we can come back to what Martha said, to be the light, to start with us. And we have these principles of architects of change. Start with the individual. Start with yourself, have faith, right? Reach out, even if you, if you think you're alone, if you think you're not gonna make it, there's a whole community here. Exchange numbers and um, you know, be a part of it. And uh, that's really your message. And that's and could Diana's I just say message. Right? That it Diana is, and herself. I've watched, Maria was one of the strongest pieces of in inspiration for writing this book. And I want to just say, I want to express my gratitude from myself and from the whole world for what you've done with your life and what Thank you're you. doing. Thank you. Thank you.